Hi, it's Mr. Mazurkowitz, and in today's video, I'll be talking to you guys about enzymes. Enzymes are going to be proteins, biological molecules, that are responsible for speeding up all the chemical reactions inside your body. So one enzyme that we worked with in the lab is an enzyme called catalase. Catalase, as seen here, remember it's a macromolecule, a protein, made up of a chain of amino acids. But catalase is going to be an enzyme specifically that speeds up the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide. Now you might have heard of hydrogen peroxide before. It's sold in stores in these brown bottles. You might have used it uh, to put on wounds and cuts. But hydrogen peroxide, believe it or not, is actually produced by your cells as a byproduct. And it is toxic. Too much of it will end up killing yourselves and killing you. So you're kind of left with this question. Why would my, or what do I do with all this hydrogen peroxide if it's going to eventually kill me? Well, hydrogen peroxide actually breaks down naturally into two uh, products. It will break down over the course of time into water and oxygen. The only problem is that this breakdown takes years to happen. So if you were to leave a bottle of hydrogen peroxide open, eventually you'd be left with just water and all that oxygen gas would escape. So what do we do about with our cells? We don't have years to get rid of this hydrogen peroxide. We'll die before that happens. So again, your body produces this protein, an enzyme called catalase, to speed up that so it happens a lot quicker and that life can exist. So again, enzymes, their job, speed up chemical reactions fast enough so that life can exist. So our essential question today is, first of all, what is the role of enzymes in biology? So we already know that they speed up chemical reactions, but we'll also go into how and what's going on at the molecular level. And then also what factors can affect their function? By the end of this video, you should have an understanding of what sorts of things make enzymes work better or in most cases worse. So we'll go through those as well. Before we can really understand how enzymes work and their role, we have to have just a basic understanding about chemical equations. So with a chemical equation, we have two things. What we start with, or what we call our reactants, and then what we end with, or what we call our products. So in the example of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, that would be my reactant. It's what I'm starting with. And as it breaks down, it ends up as O2 oxygen and H2O, which would be my products. So hydrogen peroxide as my reactant, and O2 and H2O are my products. I can also have something like, let's say, two reactants, sodium, Na, and chlorine, Cl, and those two things will interact with each other to produce or make my product salt, NaCl, which is typically what you uh, see as table salt. So again, all you really need to understand here is that my reactants are what I start with, products are what I end with. Another thing to understand is something about what do we need to get a reaction to take place. Chemical reactions can't just happen spontaneously all the time, otherwise let's say this piece of paper here or the one that you're writing on, they would just spontaneously combust into flames all the time, which would not be good. So if you think about it, any chemical equation you can think of, they require an initial input of energy. I have to do something to get it started. So if we take a look at this graph here, if A and B are going to be my reactants, what I start with, and C down here is going to be my product. Let's just take a look at the energy on my y-axis. You notice before I can get from A and B over to C, I have to input or increase the energy and then the rest of the reaction will take place. This initial input of energy that's required is called activation energy. So activation energy, the energy input required to start a chemical reaction. If you're having a bit of trouble thinking about this, just imagine a matchstick. A matchstick is a prime example. A matchstick is not going to spontaneously combust into flames. You have to strike it or input energy with friction to get that chemical reaction to take place. So all chemical reactions require activation energy to start, and that's going to be crucial when understanding uh, enzymes. So if I give you this example to kind of picture this, an analogy of a guy rolling this boulder, and he wants to get from point A here to point B. Well, this is kind of like our example of activation energy. In order to get from my reactants, over to my products, he has to overcome this hill or my activation energy. He's got to put energy in. Stop and think about this. What is something that we could do to this scenario to make this happen quicker, to get from A to B quicker? You can't use help. We got to do something to this hill to make it easier. Well, one thing you might think of is, well, what if I take my hill and I just kind of dig it out and make it a bit shorter? So in other words, I lower the activation energy. I'll get rid of this here. By doing that, we can get from point A to point B a lot quicker. And that's really what it comes down to when we talk about enzymes or this term catalyst. So a catalyst is going to be any substance, any molecule that speeds up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. If we lower the energy required for the chemical reaction, we can get it to happen a lot quicker. That's the same thing as an enzyme. Enzymes are going to be types of proteins that do this. So they're proteins that act as catalysts. Again, they lower activation energy. 
So the only real difference between the term catalyst and enzyme is that catalysts are any substance that lower activation energy, but enzymes are specifically going to be proteins. So they're the bio biological catalysts, proteins that speed up um, reactions by lowering activation energy. So how do enzymes speed these things up? One graph that you should be familiar with, if we take a look at it again, is this graph here. Um, so this is something that I highly recommend you sketching out or drawing or at very least uh, studying it so you understand what's going on here. There's not one biology test that I've seen that hasn't put this on here. So we take a look at what's going on. Let's just focus on the red line here. This is showing us the typical chemical reaction for anything. Notice the amount of activation energy required. I have to input a lot of energy before I can get all the way down to my products. So here is my activation energy without an enzyme. By adding an enzyme in though, again, we're going to lower that activation energy. So look at the blue line so that it's about half as uh, much. doesn't really matter, but we've lowered the activation energy. And again, the, uh, the reaction is going to happen a lot quicker. Another thing I just want to point out before moving on is please notice that the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products are the same for both reactions. So uh, enzymes don't do anything with the start and the finish. It's really what happens in the middle. They lower the activation energy, making the reaction happen quicker. So now that we understand kind of what enzymes are doing, they're speeding up these reactions, lowering the activation energy, what sort of things are going to affect enzyme activity? Before we can get into that, I just wanted to um, get you down to the enzyme level here so we can take a look at what, actually, uh, what happens with enzymes and their um, sub, what we call substrates. So I'm just going to call this guy here my enzyme. Let's pretend that he is going to be my catalase enzyme you used in the lab. And this thing, my hydrogen peroxide, we call these things that enzymes work on, they are called substrates. So another word for a substrate is just your reactant. It's the same thing. It's what we're starting with and it is what my enzyme is working on. So you notice that the structure of the enzyme, it has a perfect match for the shape of my substrate. Enzymes are very specific. Each enzyme has a certain shape and that shape matches up with its corresponding substrate. So we're to take a look at how this works. Let's say again that this is catalase and here's hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide will link up with its shape, it matches perfectly, it'll lower the activation energy, and it splits it into water and oxygen. Well, what happens if I change the shape? What if these factors cause a change in my shape of my enzyme? So now instead of a square, let's say it's more triangular. Well, now my substrate that matches with this doesn't match. When it tries to bind, it's not going to work, and we can't get the uh, chemical reaction to take place. So what we call this when we change the shape of our enzyme, this is what we call denaturing the enzyme. So to denature an enzyme means to change the shape. So different factors can cause enzymes to change shape, or in other words, become denatured, and now they no longer function properly. So anything that changes the shape or denatures my enzyme is going to slow down the uh, ability for my enzyme to work. So what are some factors that can do this? One thing that you guys did in the lab was you toyed around with temperature. And what most students predict, uh, right, and it's great that you do, is that the higher the temperature, the faster my reaction rate takes place. And if you think about why that is, we know that molecules are moving faster and faster and faster the more uh, temperature, the higher the temperature is. So that's causing more collisions between enzymes and their substrates, so it's working really well. But what people don't usually predict is that eventually we're going to get to a certain point. So if we take a look at this graph, we reach what's called the optimal temperature. It's kind of the sweet spot for that enzyme. And that's where the enzyme is going to work best. Once we pass that point, we notice that the activity or the rate of the reaction starts to slow down. Well, why is that? It's because the high temperature denatures the enzyme. It changes the structure. It messes up the bonds of that protein. And now the structure no longer is the same, so it can't bind to its substrate and no longer works as well. So we end up getting a curve, what we call like a bell curve, where we get faster and faster, but eventually we're going to start slowing down and we have what's called the optimal temperature. Every enzyme has its best or optimal temperature. One other thing to realize is that not all enzymes necessarily have the same optimal temperature. So we take a look at this graph here. Let's just say three different enzymes. You notice that they all have the same basic shape of their curve. They all have optimal temperatures, but not all of the same. So, uh, for example, this blue line here, this might be an enzyme you'd find in an arctic fish that lives in really, really cold temperatures. Its enzymes have adapted to work best at what looks like around 4 degrees Celsius. So anything higher than that starts to denature that enzyme. Anything lower than that, uh, again, it's not going to work as well. Your enzymes all probably have a curve that looks like this. If you think about what your body temperature is, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or around 37 degrees Celsius, all of your enzymes are going to have an optimal temperature of around there. Anything hotter than that or cooler than that, the rates of the reaction are going to slow down. 
Maybe an organism that lives in really extreme environments, really hot environments like um, hydrothermal vents or volcan volcanic areas where the temperature is really high, their enzymes are going to have an optimal temperature of let's say 90 feet, 95 degrees Celsius. So again, one thing to just notice is that all enzymes have an optimal temperature, but not necessarily the same. You should just notice that any higher or lower than that optimal temperature, the rate of the reaction is going to slow down. Another thing that can have a very similar effect is pH. So here in this graph showing instead of temperature, we're looking at different pHs, you notice that these three enzymes, which I'll go through in a second, have very similar looking curves. They have that bell curve where they have an optimal pH. So we're going to take a look at pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that is inside your stomach. If you know anything about your stomach, it's got a lot of hydrochloric acid. It's very low pH. So that low pH uh, is going to mean that pepsin wants to be at that low pH of around 2. That's its optimal pH. Anything higher or lower than that, the enzyme's activity starts to slow down. How about salivary amylase? That is an enzyme inside the saliva, inside your mouth. Well, your mouth, your saliva's pH is very neutral. It's around 7. Take a look at the uh, optimal pH of salivary amylase, right around 7. If you were to swallow that salivary amylase and it enters your stomach, it's probably going to become denatured and uh, inactive. It's going to stop working. Arginase, another enzyme, this is what you use to produce urea inside your kidneys. Your kidneys have a very basic pH, so its uh, optimal pH is higher, around a 10 or 11. So again, another thing to realize, just like temperature, all enzymes have an optimal pH that they work at depending on wh where they're found in the body. I don't expect you to memorize which one's which, but if you look at a graph, you should be able to read it and understand where the uh, enzyme has its optimal or best pH. Last but not least, another factor that can affect enzyme activity is the concentration or the amount of either the enzyme or the substrate. So if you think about this, the more enzymes or the more substrate, the thing that the enzyme works on, the faster the reaction is going to happen. There's more stuff to happen. But it doesn't just keep growing to infinity. So if we think about this, I'm going to use the example here going back to our enzymes and substrates. So here's my enzyme, and these things are my substrates. Let's say hydrogen peroxide here. How can I get this reaction to happen quicker? Well, if I only have one enzyme, let's say a very low concentration or low amount of enzyme, the enzyme can only do one thing at a time. So it might break up this one here, then go on to the next one. Then after he's done with that, he'll move on to the next one. It's really going to take a long time. Well, what if I add more enzymes or increase the concentration? Well, now I have more things working, so the reaction is going to happen quicker. And as I add more enzymes, I should get a higher or quicker uh, reaction rate. But eventually what's going to happen is I'll keep adding enzymes, but it doesn't matter. So if I add a sixth enzyme here, you notice that there's really nothing left for it to work on. So I can keep adding enzymes all day. My reaction rate technically isn't going to get any faster because there's nothing for it to work on. So we've reached what's called a point of saturation. And the same thing goes for adding more substrate. Eventually one is going to be limited by the amount of the other. So instead of our curve having that bell curve, our curve for concentration is going to look something like this. Either the substrate or enzyme concentration, the more and more that we add, the faster the rate is, but eventually we're going to hit what's called the point of saturation where it's limited by the number of the other thing. And it's not going to decrease, it's just going to kind of level off. Remember that our curve for uh, pH and temperature looks something like this, but for concentration, it's just going to increase until, again, we reach a point of uh, saturation and then it no longer increases. So that's really all there is to enzymes. By this point, you guys should have an idea about enzymes, how they work. They speed up chemical reactions by lowering that activation energy. And then you should also have a knowledge about the factors that can affect their function. Temperature and pH, uh, too high, too low is not good for certain enzymes. And concentration, just by increasing the amount and number of these things, we can get faster and faster, but just forget, don't forget, eventually it's going to level off because it's limited by the other thing. That's really all there is to enzymes, so if uh, you're having any trouble with these things, feel free to go back and watch it. Otherwise, I hope you guys learned something. Thanks a lot.